Hi, I'm Harry Forbes from ARC Advisory Group in Boston. I'm here to talk to you today about smart devices and the Internet of Things. This has been a pretty big topic in the media lately and you've probably heard quite a bit about it. It's certainly getting a lot of coverage in the media, but what I want you to understand and take away from this talk is why. Why and what? What is causing all the hype? Is there really something to this Internet of Things or not? Well, the short answer is yes, there is. There really are some things of importance here. And in this talk, what I want you to do is understand what are the causes of this excitement about the Internet of Things. As to where it will lead, we'll take a look at that. But at this point in time, it's a little bit harder to tell. But I really want you to understand what are the causes of this excitement about the Internet of Things. Our agenda really is just two points. First of all, I want to take a look at the business and technology drivers, the technologies that have improved, the costs that have changed, and changes in the way we can do business now or do industrial processes, and what is becoming feasible due to these changes in technology. So we want to look at those kind of business and technology drivers. And second, I want to take a look, a very brief look, at the impact of some of those technology developments. How will they impact various industries and services? And how could this change even whole business models? So that's what we'll be talking about today. So let's look at, first of all, the business and technology drivers. I'll identify four areas that I think are really important. There are four changes, and really what is the key here is that in each one of these four areas, we've seen a big change by orders of magnitude in the price performance of a particular uh, technology. So the four are uh, intelligence sensing, ubiquitous internet access, cloud computing, and intelligent clients are really what we would just call smartphones and client and tablets. Now each one of these areas has had a big change, but one area is not enough to really cause the excitement. What's really causing the change is the confluence, the sum of these four changes occurring more or less together. And again, the key point is that the biggest change is a huge difference in the level of performance per unit of expense or cost. So much, much different than the landscape was even just a few years ago. Let's look at each one of these four developments now, one by one. First of all, uh, intelligent or smart sensing. Um, in this area, we see the impact of low cost and high capability consumer electronics beginning now to penetrate into industrial sensing. So just as you can have a smartphone with uh, GPS, embedded networking, very high compute capacity, and low power consumption, these kind of technologies are making their way into industrial products. So this is kind of a free ride, if you will, just as industrial technology has had a free ride uh, in terms of many different IT and internet technologies, it's going to continue in the era of the smartphone. Um, industrial sensing systems are going to be, and we're seeing them now in smaller and smaller packages, being integrated with not just signal conditioning and processing or compute power, but also uh, device management, network communications, and all at a very low cost point. Industrial sensor networks are also improving. We've seen them over the last 10 years or so adopt the IT technologies of internet, I mean, excuse me, of ethernet for wired uh, networking. We've also seen them use Wi-Fi, uh, another internet technology or IT technology. But what we're seeing now as well is the development of industrial wireless sensing with specialized industrial technologies and low power technologies like uh, what we call wireless sensor networks, which is now really forked into two different developments. One we would call active wireless sensor networks, which are uh, really at a commercial stage now with commercial products in the market and, and have been in the market for several years. And passive wireless sensor networks, which are a little bit more futuristic, a little bit farther out, uh, really not commercialized at this point, but a very exciting technology that kind of combines, if you will, the technology of an RFID tag with a very small microsensor so that it's possible to embed this type of technology at a very high volume and low cost into many different applications, machines, and the like. So 
Sensing moves a little slower than the IT world, but we're seeing very important changes in the sensing world, and you can see that in the kind of products that are emerging on the market now. The second area is ubiquitous internet access, and that's extremely important, although it's been around for quite a while. The traditional way of connecting things to the internet via a cellular network has been difficult, expensive, time-consuming, and it's also provided generally a pretty low level of performance that has varied with the region and the carrier you select and all kinds of other complexities. Um, these are kind of the problems that have hogtied, if you will, the so-called M2M technology as it was defined for about the last 10 years. But now the performance of these networks has improved dramatically as the carriers have deployed new 3G and 4G networks. You're able to get better coverage and much higher data rates for devices. Not only that, the cost for connecting to the internet through these devices has dropped dramatically. So the carriers are providing costs as low as one or two dollars a month per connection depending on the level of service and so forth, always other variables. But the cost to connect to the internet via cellular connection and the complexity has dropped dramatically. So that this is another free ride or fringe benefit, if you will, of the smartphone revolution for industrial applications. But what about industrial applications where you don't have cellular coverage? Sometimes industrial applications are in some kind of remote areas. If you think of iron ore mining in Western Australia, or you think of offshore oil and gas drilling in uh, the Pacific or in the North Sea. Those kind of applications can be served by using the powerful local networking technologies and then using more specialized backhauls to connect the systems to the internet. So they also, uh, those types of industries have big drivers for this kind of connectivity as well and where they're getting it is by using a local network to build a high bandwidth connectivity into their installations and then using more specialized and higher cost obviously technologies to provide connectivity from that network to the internet and to the rest of their enterprise. The third technology that's coming along and changing uh, the landscape is an entirely new technology that's called cloud computing. And I say entirely new, really what cloud computing is is a new computing model where computing resources are located remotely and they are accessed via a network which in most cases is the internet. So they can be located entirely remotely uh, basically any place in the world and these resources can be concentrated into very large data centers. The computing model will have a different interface depending on where the consumer Inter, uh, interfaces with the application and that can be uh, different ways. Uh, the classic example is uh, Salesforce.com or Netflix. Those are really cloud applications. Those are um, software as a service applications but there are other uh, deployment models as well. Cloud is a big industry. Why is it big? Well it's about 80 billion dollars a year big. Just the costs or just the spend annually worldwide to build cloud-oriented data centers. And why it's so big is because this is the technology that has underlaid the growth of Google, Yahoo, Amazon, Facebook, Netflix, Skype, and all these other consumer internet services that we're very familiar with. The reason that a service like Google can provide search and maps and mail and so on and so forth for millions of customers is that their scalable platforms operate in these kind of data centers. So there's a big industry already worldwide and very significant technical developments to make this possible and now what's happening is the industrial world is starting to ride on this as well. The important part of this is that the cost behavior of these cloud applications is way way different than traditional IT developments that are in-house or outsourced to a remote service provider. It's less of an upfront cost. So think of it being a uh, more a pay-as-you-go. In other words, a traditional IT development, you specify, you order equipment, you integrate, you develop software, deploy. 
and then hope your scale is about right. In cloud, it's more of a pay-as-you-go model, and so it's very, very scalable, so you can start at a lower level of, of use, and as the application begins to require more resources, you just kind of more pay-as-you-go. Uh, the other advantage that it has for enterprises is, is higher speed because the procurement pieces are out of it. So this is a whole way, new way, if you will, to deploy software and services and now penetrating into the industrial world as well. So it, and another point about cloud that's quite important is that it can disrupt the software model. If you think of how uh, software companies deploy their products, um, it's different, of course, between the consumer world and the industrial world, but it basically involves uh, deployment and licensing on particular uh, platforms and so on and so forth. Um, the new software model is, will enable many, many more companies to enter the market because you can provide a specialized service on a platform, so it, it really breaks down the barriers to entry that we see in the software model. Another point about cloud that's very important is that it's standardizing. It's at a consolidation point now where new participants are finding a little bit of barriers to entry and the really major players in the market are defining platforms and trying to, to make sure that they are the ones who survive the industry consolidation. But the point is it's a very big technology. There's a lot of spend for it. It's rapidly becoming more mature and it's certainly going to be a way that many, many more applications are run in the future, including industrial applications. The fourth and final technology driver is that human interaction with applications and the internet is changing platforms. We're going from the PC to the wireless device, either a smartphone or a tablet. Now five years ago, interaction with the internet was primarily PC-based. Five years from now, the smartphone and the tablet will dominate human interaction with the internet. We're really at a point of inflection now where smartphones and tablets have just started to become much more high volume than personal computers. This is another reason, by the way, why uh, telephone companies or carriers are particularly interested in connecting devices because a new business model for them is connecting uh, intelligent client devices like this. This is going to have, obviously, a very big impact on corporate IT policies. Uh, the so-called era of bring your own device is going to have a major disruption in terms of IT device management and edge device management. They know that. It's big for enterprise IT and uh, it's, a, it's a whole new way of thinking about how you deploy applications in an enterprise when the enterprise doesn't own the device. Uh, the enterprise may cost share the device with the owner who is the employee. Um, the device will contain both personal and enterprise applications and it will contain potentially both personal and enterprise information. So this is a big challenge for the IT area that will be ongoing for several years. But the simple fact of the matter is that most of our interaction, not only with our personal internet interaction, but our business interaction will be through smart devices, either tablets or smartphones or a combination of both. So that represents a big change in the IT world, again, one that the industrial world can piggyback on. So those are the four elements of change that we talked about. Smarter industrial sensing and devices, ubiquitous internet access, the change to cloud computing, and human interaction shifting from PCs to smartphones and tablets. Now let's look at some of the impact on markets. What will these technology changes have to do with industrial markets? And the big answer right now is that we don't know all the impact. We're still at a very early stage. What we can do now is look at how these may change the way that we have done things or uh, traditionally and what will these changes enable us to do in the future. So let's take a look at that a little bit more speculatively. First of all, in terms of the kind of vertical industries that could be served. Um, if we look at and think about those technologies of smart sensing, low-cost sensing, internet connectivity, cloud computing, and, and uh, intelligent devices, applications in oil and gas certainly are offshore platforms. Um, 
uh, onshore uh, gas and oil fields, environmental and safety applications, which certainly are uh, very much in demand in those industries. All those kind of applications can use this sort of sensing. In mining, uh, there's applications for monitoring assets, especially vehicles and other major big ticket equipment. Uh, in water utilities, there is uh, remote equipment all over the place that needs to be managed uh, in transportation. There are very expensive assets like engines, jet engines is a classic case, locomotives, vehicle fleets. These can all be monitored and managed through this kind of technology. Electric power, we could think of the smart grid as really a case of this kind of deployment. And of course in factory equipment, uh, where many times now someone will build a very expensive piece of factory equipment and highly specialized and yet not understand how it's being used or deployed. So diagnostics and service and support for those kinds of pieces of equipment and also replenishment of consumables is another area where this kind of technology can help in the industrial world. When we go to the commercial world, we can look at energy and security management within buildings, lighting management within buildings, uh, also equipment uh, within buildings or uh, industrial equipment that use, is used commercially such as portable power generation, agricultural equipment, so on and so forth. Also a big area for this is medical equipment. Uh, medical equipment is very complex, has very strict compliance rules, uh, and has need for many times replenishables. It's a very ripe area for this. And finally, just pure infrastructure. If you think of transportation systems, public transportation systems, uh, public safety systems, and so forth, uh, these are very much in need of this kind of uh, capability and can benefit. Finally, in the consumer end, which may be a big area as well, one that will come up certainly is, is banking and payments. Uh, smartphone payments are definitely something that's coming. We've seen that come in terms on the business side for new technologies for accepting credit cards, but we'll see more and more of that. The so-called smart home has been around for a long time. We haven't seen very many deployments of it. It's certainly possible that this technology will, will drive that along. And another big area is automotive telematics, where we've seen more and more intelligence getting embedded into automobiles, and we're seeing that the automobile designers are putting more and more resources into the kind of systems that are for navigation, communication, uh, and uh, safety in the vehicle. So the takeaway here is that there's very, very broad applicability for these kind of technologies and that um, they can, the developments in one of these areas, say in the consumer area, can immediately or very quickly uh, cross over into a commercial or industrial area. So we're kind of at a, at a point very much like uh, the internet was 15 or 20 years ago. In terms of actual applications, basically it's anything at this point. We're at a very early stage. Uh, the, really the question to ask, this is like asking in 1993, why would anyone want to connect to the internet? Well, here are some of the apps that are valuable today. And many of these have been done for years but they've been done rather poorly, rather sporadically, rather at high cost, and only in very valuable uh, cases. Um, let's take a look at, for instance, measurement, uh, device automation, condition monitoring, data visualization. All of these things have been applied for specialized instances, but they can certainly be applied much more broadly now. As I mentioned before, personnel safety is a growing area of need, as we've seen very dramatically through uh, uh, the number of industrial accidents in the last five or six years. Um, remote service, replenishment, managing asset utilization, managing asset performance, regulatory compliance, uh, software upgrade management, and security. All these things are areas where this kind of technology can contribute to our business practices. So there's certainly, the, the field is wide open right now in terms of applicability for this kind of technology. This is a little chart from the recent uh, GE Industrial Internet Report that did a census of what they called big things that spin. And actually, they, you might call it big things that spin that are made by GE. But the census that they came up with, with over 3 million devices worldwide operating, these are big ticket items 
that cost millions of dollars of investment each and most of them are not monitored or the ones that are monitored are very poorly monitored. And the report that they issued in the end of November of 2012 asked what would happen if we could improve performance across this set of assets, which of course GE has some control over because they make them all, but suppose we could improve the performance of this set of assets, uh, either their uh, technical performance or their utilization, uh, even by a small amount like 1%, what would be the impact? Well, actually the impact, as they showed, would be very, very large. But the impact is not just a savings. For the equipment manufacturer, there's an impact in terms of differentiating your product. Because if you have this kind of capability so that customers can use your product more effectively or at lower cost, then even a commoditized product can effectively be differentiated. Here's another census of the types of devices that are coming. Um, again, most of, most of the devices, if you look through this pyramid, are really only marginally connected to the internet today. And the installed base of these kinds of devices are based on the costs that were in effect when the system was divine, designed, so that connectivity was very, very expensive. But now this is changing, and we expect that these types of devices will very much in the future have network and internet connectivity as a given. And so that, uh, remember that we talked about the cost dropping by an order of magnitude or two. As that progresses into the design cycle of these kinds of devices, we're going to see much, much more connectivity built into them. Now, let's look at a contrast between the legacy way, if you will, the traditional way of deploying an application and the way we might deploy a similar application in the era of these new technologies. On the left, we see the old way. That is, you integrate devices in the field, put servers in the field, provide connectivity to the servers, procure and develop software for enterprise services, and deploy it all for, for in-house in clients. Uh, this kind of application has been used for many, many years for uh, asset management of various types of fleets of equipment. That's very difficult, it's very expensive, and these have evolved over time. It's very difficult to scale them up. Um, it's been a challenge. In the new method of deployment, the edge integration becomes much simpler because of the improved networking of the sensing and automation systems at the edge. The infrastructure that captures the data and manages the applications is no longer has to be owned by the asset manager. In effect, can be leased from someone else. The application can be built uh, by many people and can, can include software supplied by many others and integrated on a cloud platform and deployed to clients anywhere on the internet. And the costs associated with that application are more directly connected to the level of how many deployments there are. In other words, if you're monitoring 1,000 assets, you'll have a significantly different cost than if you're monitoring 10,000 or 100,000. So this model, if you will, not only will provide easier integration, higher performance, but it will also have a cost basis that much more scales to the level of service. So it pays, uh, it looks mo much more appetizing to people who are looking to deploy this kind of service. Finally, let's just look at what the networks are going to look like for an application at the site, at the edge, if you will. Um, traditionally, we've built sensor networks out of either field bus uh, or now wireless sensing networks. Um, and we're building local networks from industrial ethernet in one of its many flavors and industrial Wi-Fi. This is going to continue, but as I mentioned before, um, wireless sensor networks are going to continue to grow and industrial ethernet is going to be extremely important and will take an, an increasing share. Um, Wi-Fi will be used to connect to particular areas where physical connectivity is difficult, but it's also going to be used uh, to provide a cloud, if you will, of coverage over remote sites. In terms of what the uh, backhaul will be to connect a remote site to an application, whether it be in the enterprise or in the cloud. 
We're going to use the existing enterprise network if there is one, but if there isn't one, cellular, the new 4G cellular networks will be much, much more adaptable to this kind of service than at present. And finally, if there are cases where the area is too remote or cellular communication is simply not going to work, then we can provide other kinds of internet access. If you think about it today, while you're riding on many uh, commercial jetliners, you can have internet access. And, and so that is an illustration, if you will, that there are very, very uh, unusual technologies that are available, albeit at higher cost points. So let's just summarize what we've talked about here. First of all, there's a surge in interest in smart devices and the Internet of Things, and it's caused by huge changes in price performance in four areas. One of them is sensing, one of them is networking, which means in this case Internet access through cellular communications. The third one is cloud computing, a whole new architecture for computing. And the fourth one is a whole new family or class of intelligent clients, either smartphones or tablets. Second, this enables the potential value of uh, many, many applications for remote asset management and services. And, that, and it changes the model from large upfront investments toward a pay, more a pay-for-use model, a cost model that's much more attractive to end-user customers and to solution providers. Third, this, is, this kind of technology will be applicable across many, many applications and many industries. And not only is it going to be used in the industrial space, it's going to be used in the commercial and consumer space too. So we'll see fertilization between those areas as technologies are developed or solutions are developed in one area they can cross over. And finally, that has the potential to really change or transform business models. In other words, the way that we have managed assets, the way that people have provided aftermarket services, and the way that people have developed and deployed software for specialized applications or for the enterprise will be changing very radically. So we're at a point of pretty big change right now in terms of all of these areas and we think it's going to be pretty neat. Um, we live in very interesting times and I think as we watch these uh, era, this era of smart devices and cloud computing get going and the Internet of Things, we're going to find some very interesting developments coming in the next few years. Thank you for listening to this talk and I thank you for giving ARC the opportunity to share our ideas with you and we look forward to doing that more in the future. Thank you.